Professor Gabor. We're going to cover this chapter 15 in two parts. It's rather lengthy. And it's about data and competitive advantage. Uh, how to turn your, your data into information that allows you to have insights into your business and grow your business or take advantage of uh, opportunities that may occur. Uh, so that's databases, analytics, and then we'll talk about a little bit about artificial intelligence and machine learning, which uh, is a field that has always been promising, and it always seems like it's about to turn the corner, and I'm never sure if it has or hasn't. Computing power has certainly helped that. So the learning objectives, understand how increasingly standardized data, access to third-party data, cheap, fast computing, and of software that's easier and easier to use, uh, debatable, uh, collectively enables a new age of decision making. So we want to be familiar with some enterprises that have benefit from data-driven and fact-based decision making. So big data. Uh, this is more than fits in an Excel spreadsheet. Millions and millions of uh, files, uh, lines of code, I mean lines of data uh, and data records. Um, you, it, it will bog Excel down if you try to do it in Excel. So uh, this is like having all the information you need. Normally, uh, when we talk about statistics and statistical inference, we take a sample of data and try to make an inference on the population. Uh, big data assumes that you have all the data there is. So that's different. So it's a massive amount of data. And, and I suggest that you watch the other presentation on just the proliferation of data, the mountain ranges of data that I talked about before. So some things, data can be structured or unstructured. And uh, you can put different databases together and compare things and look at, get insights uh, because there's some excellent new tools, most of them being uh, open source. Uh, Decision-making is data-driven, fact-based, and enabled. I mean, this is a principle of total quality, which is why it appeals to me so much, because my background happens to be in total quality management. And the more you can make uh, database and fact-based decisions, the better. Uh, I mean, it just makes sense. So you want to, um, and this is enabled, of course, by standardized corporate data that's available to everyone in the corporation uh, in theory, but in actuality, it's available to those that need to know or need to use the data. So, um, and we talked about accessing third-party softwares. Business intelligence is uh, combines the aspects of reporting, data exploration, and queries into your database or databases and modeling and analysis. And modeling and analysis usually require, we're talking about correlations and regression studies from a statistics standpoint. Analytics is a term that's, you know, again, taking that data and statistical quantitative analysis, uh, looking at explanatory and predictive models. The explanatory model tells you the way things are. Predictive looks more into the future. Or, or uh, explanatory is not as much time-based, but just relationships between two different variables. If inflation is here, uh, unemployment will be there. If unemployment is here, inflation might be there. I don't know which one causes which, but you understand what I'm saying. There's no time involved. Predictive means if I'm selling this now, how much will I sell in the future um, based on time and other variables? And so we're talking about fact-based management to dr drive decisions and actions as much as possible. Machine learning is a type of artificial intelligence that leverages massive amounts of data. So computers can make their own um, decisions for us. Uh, and maybe um, machine learning or artificial intelligence that's involved here uh, could be reading x-rays and reading CAT scans and seeing things that maybe human beings uh, might miss. So um, the benefits of data mastery. Well, data leverage is at the center of competitive advantage in firms like Amazon, Netflix, Zara. I mean, if you want to watch uh, a, a video um, documentary called um, The Social Dilemma, you'll see how even uh, Google and Facebook are using 
uh, data and machine learning and artificial intelligence to really manipulate how you use and keep using and are available for advertisers on those platforms. It's a little depressing, but it's worth watching. Um, Walmart moved to the top of the Fortune 500 list. Um, as I told you, the, what differentiated Walmart from everybody else in the 90s was their information systems. And I think they keep using that to their advantage, even though they're not, I wouldn't say they're the premier company for that. I would say Amazon would be more than them, but who knows. Um, encourages firms to make their product the best it can possibly be, especially if they can get insights into consumer needs and wants, which has always been hard to do. Uh, Data-driven insights are credited with helping politicians win elections um, or get people to believe that the election was stolen. And I don't know. <laughs> it has goods and bad uses. The, the, same, the same thing that's used for good can be used for bad, I suppose. Okay, uh, data analytics and competitive advantage. Early to capture uh, uh, of data assets can be the difference between a dominating firm and an also ran. It can help distinguish things. If you can use the mountain range of information you have and glean uh, information from that mountain range of data and turn it into information that you can take action on faster, better, quicker than your competitors, well, then you will you should have an advantage. Um, advantage that are based on, you know, and also the analytic methods that you use. And uh, so, but, you know, you have to keep on top of this all the time because the data... Uh, if other people see what you're doing or get a glimpse of what you're doing or hire someone that can do the same things that you're doing, um, your competitive advantage won't last for long. So um, I think here is a good point. Differentiation, will be the, differentiation is the key between distinguishing operationally effective data from those efforts that can yield true strategic, strategic positioning. So, I mean, there's some operational things certainly that I want to look at, but if I can gain insights to uh, provide a new product or service in a way that no one else has looked at, and I can do that on an ongoing basis, I'm ahead of the game. So for the next section, we want to talk about uh, understanding the key differences between data and information. We may have talked about this in a previous presentation that I posted. Uh, know the key terms and technologies associated with data organization and management. Well, data is the wrong, raw facts and figures. It's numbers. It's address. It's uh, what you bought, what you didn't buy. Um, it's whatever might be in the information systems um, that in your databases, in the records, in your personal history, in the history of a jet engine, uh, that you have, uh, you know, a terabyte of data every time the, the plane flies from point A to point B. You have all this, this just raw data of, uh, you know, torque, heat, uh, or, you know, temperature, uh, stress, whatever is collected by the sensors on a jet engine. You have this entire history of it. What you do with it next is the important thing. It's not helping you at all. It's like in a set of encyclopedias sitting on the, you know, the, your shelf that you never opened a book. Well, you have all this information, you have all this potential information, but you're not accessing it. Information now is you take the data and sift through it, sort through it, uh, organize it, display it, uh, manipulate it, whatever you might want to do to turn the data into information that you as a manager or your managers can look at. Knowledge is an insight uh, derived from experience and expertise based on data and information. I mean, if I'm new in a job, I don't have any experience. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's the experiential and expertise aspect of looking at data turned into information over time. You have some patterns that you might be able to recognize that maybe a greenhorn might not be able to see. A database is a single table or collection of related tables. By table, think of a spreadsheet. Each row is a file, or each column is a file, and um, let's think of, of rows. So it might be, um, you know, a database of your information in North Park's uh, computer system. First, it has your name, first, middle, last, 
It assigns you an ID number, whether you're a faculty or not. And then it tells you faculty, student, alumni. Uh, so you, you have a designated key column that tells if you're, you know, what your current status is. Uh, home address, phone number, uh, number of credits, uh, this, that, the other thing. If uh, you're a student, it might, uh, you know, you, I don't think it's going to keep any of your financial information there, but by your student ID, we can go to another database and find out, you know, look at your academic record and another database and look at, uh, based on your name and your ID number, there'll be another row of all the classes you've taken. There'll be another folder, if you will, on, on, on the computer that contains all the classes you've taken. Another one will tell you your financial history with North Park and keep in mind any uh, scholarships or tuition discounts you may have negotiated when you got accepted and uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, where your status is on uh, paid up to date or owing money. And if you owe money, you, you know, you would use that to signal that, ooh, gee whiz, you can't register for classes until you pay your bill from last semester, blah, blah, blah. So a database management system, is, so you have the database, it's just a raw file. It's a, a computer file with a lot of rows and columns and numbers and maybe labels in it. The database management system is a software for, for accessing, creating, updating. Um, it's not like a spreadsheet where you just open it and immediately make the changes. It's usually a, a database that if you looked at the numbers, you might not know what's in there, but you need a software system that makes it look like a spreadsheet, that brings up your record in a way that human beings like to look at it, and you can change it, update it, and just see what's going on. So it's a software for creating, maintaining, and manipulating data to a certain amount. Um, you can use a database management system to uh, do a, a query and only look for all male students, uh, if, you were, if, at, if you're at North Park, or only look at uh, professors that are between the ages of 30 and 40 or, you know, blah, 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 um, how many marriage students we have. You could, and then download that to a spreadsheet. Now, a structured query language, SQL, is a language used to create and manipulate databases that's more sophisticated than database management systems, uh, a little bit. And they overlap considerably. So a database administrator is a, you know, <laughs> going to ERP systems, reduces the, the headcount in many areas, but there are certain areas in which you have to increase headcount. The database uh, administrator or administrators or database managers are critical because a database manager has a responsibility to make sure that the data in the systems um, are, you know, he's responsible for the design and creation and maintenance of that database and implementing it, but once it's implemented, you're, you're basically talking about the first two steps, design and creation are done when you implement the um, ERP system. That's one of the first things you do. But then once it's up and running, you maintain it. Also, database design and creation assumes that, let's assume in this day and age, 2021, if you're creating a new database, you're probably replacing an old system with a new system. So you have to migrate the data from the old to the new. That's also a responsibility here. And in doing so, why would I want to bring all my crappy data over? I would probably want to do a data cleanup as much as possible. If you have data in a database, it's not all going to be accurate because who puts data in and takes data out and changes data? Human beings. Are they infallible? No, they're going to make mistakes. You can fat finger entering someone's phone number. You can, um, you know, the name could be, you could be male, but you type female. It, uh, uh, you could enter an SKU number wrong, or you could enter, any of the information could be entered erroneously. So there's always a, a data, you know, someone's moved, but they haven't put a change of address. So, you know, it's, you think it's right, but it's wrong. So that's important. The other thing is backup and recovery of the data. If your system goes down or blows up or uh, you're, you know, uh, I don't know, there's a fire in your, uh, where the server is and, and, and all your data turns into a molten heap, 
of silicon and uh, copper, um, you should back up your data all the time so that you can go back to at least the previous day at another site. And that's not very expensive. That's a redundancy that's worth paying for so that you can get to it. Uh, policy setting and enforcement, who can change what, who has access to what information, because not everybody in the company wants can have access to everything else. Your boss and HR, certain people in HR could have access to your salary. Um, you can have access to your salary and your personal benefits. Other people in the company shouldn't have access to it. So who has the ability to see it and not see it? And they're responsible for security because uh, one of the security issues could be uh, hijacking your data and, uh, or, you know, this, this idea of ransomware, which we'll cover in another presentation. So um, security is important. The other thing that's not here is what they call uh, data management, which is increasingly like cycle counting for inventory. You go through and review the data on a cyclic basis and make sure that the data is okay. And if there's issues, you go in and clean it up because the, the ERP system is only as good as the integrity of the data in it. Very important job. So here's a way. A row is called a record. Think of a spreadsheet. Um, a row in a database is a record that represents a single instance of whatever you're keeping track of. Uh, if you're a retail store, a, a row could be a sales event. Um, it could have the customer name or the customer credit card, and it could have all the items you buy and the price you paid and how much it was. So then I could keep track. If, if I look at that, I could look at yesterday and find out um, how many cups of coffee I sold, uh, eight ounce cups of regular coffee, or how many uh, big pens that I sell in my store or whatever. Or if I want to look at over history and find out what are... Um, uh, males between the age of 15 and 20 buying, I could do an analysis of that and um, gear advertising to that, uh, that demographic and increase sales. So the column is a field, and that represents, so if one's a sales record, you could have customer name or customer credit card number, if there's such a thing, or customer frequent, uh, frequent shopper number, um, you could have the SKU numbers of what they bought, the quantity, and the price. And if you have this for the past 15 years of your company or the past five years, maybe you archive anything older than five years, uh, you'd have a tremendous record of your daily sales. And you could slice and dice it by any of the columns. So the rows are the raw data of each transaction in this case. Or if it's a, a, a HR file, it's each employee or ex-employee. And the columns are, by, are, are what you use to slice and dice the data to refine it and have a smaller database spreadsheet, if you will, of um, specific demographic of humans that you're looking at or specific uh, criteria of sales that you're looking at, whatever the case may be. So a table of files, a list of data arrangement columns and rows. This is a, a structured database. Uh, because there's structure to it. The rows are represent a record of interest and the columns are the fields that define that interest, uh, fields of information of data that are of interest. Now a relational database is the most common and standard for expressing these databases where the tables are related by these common keys the, or the columns. And um, it's relational because I, that's where I can do slicing and dicing easy. So it, it's like if you're sorting on Excel or only looking at, you know, specific ranges or choices in a specific column, it's, it's, it's kind of good. If you've ever done a pivot table in Excel, once you've reduced your database to a certain size and got the pertinent information, then that's a, an, an analytic approach to looking at what happens. So uh, we want to understand the various internal and external sources for enterprise data. 
and look at the function of data aggregators and leveraging third-party data and all of those. The promise is huge, and we'll see how that works. Uh, I don't have a lot of experience in that use of third-party data, more so with just data inside the company. So a transaction processing system. These are ones that record a transaction or some other form of business-related exchange, such as a cash register or sale, ATM, and stores it all in that relational database that we just talked about. So I was talking about uh, uh, you know, keeping track of each sales record that happens in all of Walmart all across the world, or Amazon for that matter. So it's any kind of business exchange. A loyalty card is, you know, system that provides rewards. That's what we talked about, the frequent shopper card. Um, and so if you have all of this kind of information, all of a sudden you're looking at uh, a wealth of possible information and insight you can get. So uh, firms uh, will have this enterprise software, CRM, SCM, ERP. I think ERP is still the large umbrella of uh, SAP and Oracle kind of software that has CRM, which is a customer resource management a relationship management system inside of it, and a supply chain management system inside of it. That's kind of the way I look at it. Our firm set up systems to gather additional data beyond conventional purchase transactions or website monitoring. Actually, the supply chain management and ERP software, those, are those manage all your transactions. All the information for all the transactions that you do inside the company are there. CRM is the data file on the customer. And it could feed off of, it could include information from the SCM or the ERP, but it's really all the customer information. You know, let me pull up your record when you call uh, Commonwealth Edison or the gas company. Uh, they pull up your record, they're using a CRM system. Uh, they could see if you have your date of birth in there. Oh, gee whiz, Mr. Gavor, happy birthday. See, it's your birthday. Or you had a birthday a couple of days ago. How was it? Yeah, so uh, and what are you calling about today? Well, I'm inquiring about my bill. It seemed overly large, and I thought I made a payment. And, oh, yes, we see that the payment was received on this date, and the bill went out a few days before that, so it's not reflected in the bill that you received. Uh, no worries. What you owe is this much. Oh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for calling. And if uh, uh, the person in the call center that answered the phone, if you're lucky enough to get someone that answers the phone, could then type in a CRM system, customer's happy, uh, here was the inquiry from the customer, and it probably has a click-down menu that you can pick from a variety of different things. So then they can see what are customers calling about, what are customers not calling about. So if you're trying to get an automated system to avoid having to have people answer phones, um, you can make it much more easy to navigate that information at some later day. Um, so this is what we're talking about. The other thing with the CRM system, if you're doing um, a developmental sales or, or, or whatnot, and someone calls you with an inquiry, so let's just say it's a business-to-business -business inquiry, and they're calling me and they say, hey, Mr. Gavor, I understand uh, um, you know, you're the uh, director of logistics uh, at XYZ Company, and um, you know, we, we have a brand new uh, transportation management software that uh, integrates uh, with almost every ERP and is superior to them because it does this and that and might specifically appeal to your industry. And I might say, uh, oh, listen, I'd like to hear about it. I can't talk right now. Um, you know, uh, let's say uh, my father's in the hospital and uh, I've got to drive to Detroit and can you call back in a week? Well, CRM system will also, they can say, call back in a week, father was in the hospital. Um, so they call back in a week, and it's the same person, and it says, hey, Mr. Gore, sorry, you know, uh, last time we talked, you couldn't talk, and it reminds them, because they took notes in the CRM system, and says, hey, your father was in the hospital. Um, I hope everything uh, turned out okay. And, you know, then I could say, well, that's very kind of you to remember, and, um uh, thank you, he's doing well, or uh, something awful happened. Um, but that's the case. 
And so then you have these things, you know, that's why people call back so efficiently. It's not like they remember or put a little sticky pad, a little post-it on their monitor screen. They have a CRM system. And the CRM systems can be very sophisticated to remember all these kinds of little things. You can put little notes in it and stuff. And uh, it's quite helpful, especially if you're doing cold calling or business development calling, or even if you're, it's the 800 number for an ongoing uh utility or, or other company that uh, either uh, an individual or a firm is doing business with. Surveys. Uh, I don't know how many people fill out surveys anymore. Um, firm supplement operational data with input from surveys and focus groups. Focus groups are a different thing. They pay people to go and give them some sort of incentive to come. When I worked in New York City, I got on some sort of um, focus group, I must have been on 20 focus groups and they paid me $150 each time I went. I would go, I would leave work a little early, go there, participate in a focus group, get on a train, go home with a $150 check. It was great. Uh, I don't know how biased it was that they kept using me over and over again, but you know, <laughs> you'd like to have a more random focus group than, than, than I think it was. Uh, direct surveys can give better information in a cash register, but people are not filling out surveys. I really don't think people are filling out surveys. Trying to get people to fill out surveys is like pulling teeth. Um, the people don't want to be bothered. If it's at all lengthy, if it's like two questions, maybe they'll do it. If it's not, and you're only going to hear of people that are like really, really happy or really, really mad at you, and you don't hear from the average people. So I don't know how important surveys are. But CRM... Uh, many CRM products have survey capabilities that allow for additional data gathering at all points of customer contact. And oftentimes, if you're checking out of a hotel, is there anything we can do? They, you know, the CRM system will prompt them with a couple questions they can ask customers and not take up a lot of their time. Um, uh, can technology cure U.S. healthcare? So it has a Potentially reduce errors, improve healthcare quality, and save costs. So hospital networks and technology companies are partnering to help tackle costs and quality issues. Uh, one way is how do you make sure that you get, people get the right medicines and the right uh, dosage and all of that. So a use of barcode systems on, uh, on automated dispensing systems. It might put it into a cup with a barcode on it and a name that says, oh, this goes to patient, you know, uh, Joe, Joe Smith. And uh, here's the medicine for this, this round while you're delivering the truck. And then you scan the little cup with the medicine in it. And you scan the, um, the barcode uh, on the patient's chart or on their wrist. And if the it says oh, you, you're giving him Mrs. Mrs. Um, Johnson's, uh, you're not giving Joe Smith his medicine, you're giving her him Mrs. Johnson's medicine. Stop that. Go back and get his medicine and give it to the right person. Uh, so that will help stop it. So, and if you have the dose dispensing also, um, I, I did some work with a company that was looking to have like a vending machine that would take the, you know, the 20 most popular uh, medicines in a nursing home. Uh, and dose them out by person, print a little label on a cup so that you'd have the information and not screw it up. Uh, I think someplace, and the reason for this is like 6% of the people um, in <laughs> get the wrong medicine or the wrong dosages in nursing home. That's 10-year-old information. Hopefully it's improved since then. But leveraging data through doctor-patient value chain uh, consider event-driven medicine. Uh, if they have a patient with chronic disease, they can generate a decision support screening sheet. Um, you know, there's this is where the artificial intelligence and stuff goes. I mean, doctors can't remember everything, but if the computer has, here's a list of all the medicines you're taking and the doctor prescribes a new medicine, it may say, whoa, 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 don't do that. These medicines will interact negatively. If you're trying to prescribe this new medicine, you might want to try this one instead, which is better and with the current list of medicines that this patient is taking. 
Sounds good. Can doctors remember all that? Well, they really try. They're not trying to, to, to screw it up, uh, but you can't remember everything. It's like LinkedIn, right? I don't know. Uh, everyone in this class, you may have told me that you had a friend that works for American Airlines uh, and is an executive there. Can I remember that? Will I remember it forever? I might or might not. There might be a need where I'm looking for a job at American Airlines, and I'm like, oh, yeah, someone knew someone at American Airlines. Who was that? And I can't remember who it was, or I don't even remember that you had a, a friend at American Airlines. LinkedIn, what does it do? It remembers all that for me. So I type in American Airlines, it can say, hey, your former student um, has a friend who happens to be, you know, a friend on LinkedIn, who happens to be her aunt that, that's an executive at American Airlines. Oh my God. It's ex and then I look at the person's profile and it's exactly in the area that I want to have an inquiry for either a job or sell consulting services. So then I can write the student and say, so it can, why should people have to remember everything you, you you just don't have to let the let the software do it for you let your databases do the work uh, part of and I don't think I've said this before in ERP systems you want the ERP system to do the heavy lifting and you want human beings to only react uh, to information that's needed or react in um, uh, if, if it requires human intervention so that's where you'd like to get to oops uh, let's see, did we get this? Okay, we did surveys, we did that. Okay, can, uh, so we can combine electronic medical information with artificial intelligence and best practices. Um, nearly every major technology company now has a health solutions group. It's such an important area. In fact, um, I would say just in the past 10 years, all medical records are entered directly into an iPad or you see doctors walking around with pads and open computers now and or computers in every workstation where they can log in uh, quickly and bring up your patient file and update everything. When I go to my doctor, she's talking to me while she's typing um, and discussing, oh, I want you to do this. I want you to do that. Or oh, your blood pressure was good, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. You shouldn't even have to enter the blood pressure if you have the right kind of machine um, that will give you a, a, a visual readout of the data, but also uh, send it Bluetooth or however to the system. The less you have, the less numbers you have to type and press and punch in, the less chance there is for error. External sources. So organizations can have their products sold by partners and can rely heavily on data collected by others. Uh, I work, you know, I work for Colgate Palmolive. Uh, they sold their toothpaste to stores. Walmart, Target, Kroger, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those stores sell it to consumers and end users. So why don't we uh, look at that and see what's going on? I have to take a phone call, so this is an ideal place to end uh, this session right now. Thank you.